So this is the situation that's happening in Thailand. Mass protests against the monarchy and the government are breaking out all over Bangkok. There have been both standoffs and clashes between Thailand's authorities and protesters. On the night of November 8, 10,000 protesters marched to the Grand Palace to deliver letters to King Vajira Longkorn, only to be met by water cannons. In October, a number of prominent protest leaders were also arrested, including human rights lawyer Anon Nampa, who was one of the earliest activists to speak up specifically against the monarchy. So why are Thais so frustrated with their king and what does this poodle have to do with any of it? Chapter 1. Who is the Thai monarchy? Okay, first off, Thailand has a constitutional monarchy, meaning that the rulers are essentially figureheads, or heads of state. They sign bills passed by the legislature and receive foreign dignitaries. King Maha Vajra Longkorn, whose reign began in 2016, is the only son of the previous king, King Pumipon Adunyade. King Vajra Longkorn was made a crown prince at 20 years old and he's reportedly quite a character. He is known and often criticized for his lavish lifestyle. Vajra Longkorn has seven children from his three marriages. His mother once described him to reporters as a little bit of a Don Juan. Is it right to be seen frolicking around in a crop top rather than a crown? He's a qualified civilian and fighter pilot, which is kind of convenient for him because that means he can fly his very own Boeing 737. Which is probably why since he ascended the throne, he's been overseas a lot, most of the time in fact. He spends a lot of his time in the remote resort town of Bavaria, which is southwestern of Germany. And although the weather is a lot more tropical back in Thailand, it's in Europe where the king prefers to hang out in crop tops, fake tattoos, and according to German media, a frequently rotating consort of women. He's had three wives before this current one, and also has a royal consort. In his previous marriages, there's been a lot of drama. Public denouncements, disowning his sons, arresting his ex-wife's family members, and more. But the current king did have one companion who never fell out of favour with him. His poodle, Fufu. Here's Fufu in 2007 celebrating his birthday. Fufu was also made an air chief marshal. Clearly, this is a man who loved his dog so much such that when his pet passed away in 2015, Fufu was given four days of Buddhist funeral rites before he was cremated. King Vajra Longkorn is definitely accustomed to accessing an impressive amount of resources. In October 2019, he ordered a transfer of two army units to come directly under the palace's command. Technically, kings can do this if there's a national emergency or a threat to the monarchy, but he never mentioned what the threat was. In June 2018, Thailand's CPB also announced that all its assets were now in the king's hands. The portfolio is worth over 40 billion USD. That's like three commas. The CPB has said that the management of these assets will be transparent and open to scrutiny. Of course, people might not be too vocal about their criticisms against the king, given the very real possibility of imprisonment under less majestic laws, a law in Thailand that makes it illegal to criticize the monarchy. Okay, so that's the current king, but what about the former king, his father, King Pumipon? Until his death in 2016, King Pumipon was the longest reigning monarch, setting the record at 70 years. Throughout his rule, he was a king well loved by his people and was like a father figure to them. He oversaw a ton of industrial and agricultural development projects, and these improve life for thousands of Thais. But he didn't just manage these projects from the comfort of his palace. In fact, he would often take trips to the rural areas and talk to the farmers. That wasn't his only interaction with commoners. After he was ordained as a monk, King Pumipon wandered the streets for two weeks with a shaved head and in yellow robes, carrying only a begging bowl. If people recognised him as a king, he'd jump into a getaway car, presumably before people could swamp him like a bunch of over-enthusiastic K-pop fans. Noteworthy incidents like these, and the consistent image of his concern for his subjects, earned him the nickname the People's King. Some even saw him as divine and godlike. This is because the ancient concept of kingship has influence from both Hindu and Buddhist cultures. Rama, the term used to refer to kings in Thailand, is adopted from the Hindu god's namesake, who is an avatar of another Hindu god, Vishnu. Traditionally, they are perceived by the people to have a certain moral authority, linked to the Buddhist concept of a Dhammaraja. It is basically a king whose rule should be aligned with Buddhist values, like integrity and self-restraint. Anyway, since taking the throne in 1946, King Pumipon has ruled through 20 coups and coup attempts, with the latest successful coup happening in 2014. King Pumipon played significant roles in several coups, but one of the most important took place in the Black May of 1992. That was when many Thais protested against Army Chief General Suchinda Krapayun. He had become the Prime Minister via a constitution drafted by the military, meaning he wasn't elected by the public. Unfortunately, the army opened fire on unarmed civilians, killing at least 52 people. At the height of these tensions, 
King Pumipon summoned General Suchinda and the leader of the opposition, Chamlong Sri Muang, to his palace. The meeting was televised in an iconic broadcast where the king chided the two leaders who knelt before him. It was an impactful image that resonated with many Thais. This elevated King Pumipon as the ultimate mediator and unifier across the country's deep political divides. One indicator of Thailand's deep devotion to King Pumipon was the outpouring of grief when his death was announced in 2016. The country had a year-long mourning period in which the entire nation wore black. Over 10 million Thais paid respect to his body, which was laid in state at the Grand Palace. The mourning period culminated in a five-day state funeral, which, according to the Japan Times, cost around 90 million USD. Chapter 2. So why are Thais protesting? Now let's get into the mass protests, which have been largely led by youths. Here are their three main demands. Number 1. They want Prayut Chanocha to resign as Prime Minister. Number 2. They want a more democratic constitution which will protect civilian rule. And number 3. They are calling for reforms to the monarchy. These include changes like separating the king's private wealth from crown assets and getting the king to stop endorsing coups. So, who is Chanocha and why do so many Thais dislike him? Well, to start, he's had a rather controversial path to his position. That's because he led the 2014 coup which ousted then PM Yingluck Sinawat. Chanocha was the commander of the Royal Thai Army back then, so naturally, the military took control of the government. And then he himself declared himself PM. Another situation fueling these protests is the outcome of the 2019 general election. One party in particular was exceptionally popular amongst young people, the Future Forward Party. It was established in 2018 and it ran primarily on a platform of restraining military power and demanding accountability from the government. Future Forward actually performed quite well in the elections, receiving 6 million votes. They were also amongst the top three parties voted into the House of Representatives. However, in February 2020, they disbanded because a court ruled that a loan of 6 million USD by their founder was in fact a donation. Thai election laws kept donations to political parties at 320,000 USD, making the $6 million figure illegal. The founder argued that there was no chance for them to raise funds any other way and insisted that it was a loan. Ultimately, the court stripped him of his role as an MP. Together with 16 other party leaders, he was banned from politics for 10 years. Future Forward supporters and pro-democracy activists were understandably frustrated by this ruling, seeing it as a move by Chan Ocha's government to hold on to power and further quell dissent. This isn't the only controversial act by Chan Ocha's government. After the coup in 2014, Chan Ocha's next move was to come up with a new constitution that would heavily favour the military. The new 2017 constitution allowed them to fill all 250 Senate seats with whoever they wanted, effectively giving them control of Thailand's entire Senate. This was designed to severely limit the influence of political parties, and they even banned campaigning. Also, this happened. <laughs> Actually, Chan Ocha was a trendsetter ahead of his time because he banned political gatherings of more than five people. So kind of like social distancing, except the disease the government is trying to prevent is an outbreak of democracy. They also introduced the Computer Crimes Act, which is ostensibly meant to guard against fake reports and hate speech. Under this law, the government can make copies of information, access data networks and seize computers. It has drawn protests from free speech advocates, internet companies and businesses. If this constitution sounds like it's infringing on several civil liberties, and then you must be wondering, hey, why nobody complain against it ah? Well, oddly enough, it was put up for a public referendum and it passed. Though turnout was low at 50%, lower than its target of 80%. I mean, it's not like there were zero complaints, but you could be jailed if you encourage people to reject the constitution. To put this into perspective, it's like if your dad asks you, Hey, what you want to eat for dinner? You want to eat in Taifung? And then you react, Hey, very expensive leh. And then he counters, No, now your options are eating in Taifung or being locked in your room. So yeah, in 2017, if the Thais wanted to protest this pro-military constitution, they had to pay quite a steep price. Another surprising thing about this military constitution is that King Bajira Longkorn actually weighed in on it and had a few amendments in mind. Usually, it's more paperwork for the royals, but their signature is really important because it legitimises the government and by extension, it endorses whoever's in charge. In 2017, the changes the king wanted written in were meant to expand his power. For instance, he could now leave the country without appointing a regent. In theory, this could allow him to rule from abroad, and he does have a tendency to be overseas quite often, which is just one of the things the Thai protesters are unhappy with. So it's no wonder protesters want to check the king's power. Asking for these royal reforms is what makes the 2020 protests unique. The previous ones have mainly pitted supporters of a military-backed government against those who want more democratically elected leaders. 
It's also especially significant because Thailand's royal family has been considered untouchable. Historically, very few people would dare to speak up against them because of the very strict Les Majes laws I mentioned earlier. They're designed to protect the king, queen and heirs to the throne against defamation, insult and threats. Those prosecuted under this law can face up to 15 years in jail. It's been used to sentence anyone, from the parents and siblings of King Vajiralongkorn's ex-wife to a guy who shared a sarcastic comment about King Pumipon's dog. According to a report by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, the number of people investigated for these less majestic incursions have doubled since the military took power. PM Chanocha has repeatedly upheld the law as necessary to protect Thai royalty. But human rights groups argue that it's often used to silence or threaten opponents of his administration. Amnesty International has described it as a way to silence peaceful dissent and jail prisoners of conscience. Thousands of people are now gathering in Bangkok streets to oppose this strict law and more broadly, the military junta's effort to limit democratic processes. The authorities aren't the only side the protesters have to contend with. They also face staunch opposition from royalist supporters. They are typically from a generation of Thais who grew up and prospered under King Pumipon and tend to be pro-government. King Vajiralongkorn simply expressing gratitude to a supporter has emboldened them. And the man even went as far as tattooing the king's praise on his body to show his devotion to the throne. And how has the monarch at the centre of all this reacted? According to PM Chanocha, the king has advised him not to enforce any of these less majest laws. The king has also been largely silent on this matter. But when Channel 4 News and CNN asked for his opinion, this was his response. But what do you say to the protesters who've been on the streets who want reform? I have no comment. No comment. We love them all the same. We love them all the same. We love them all the same. Is there any room for compromise, sir? Thank you. Oh, Thailand is a land of compromise. Okay. On one hand, students have been allowed to protest on their campuses. According to the Education Minister Nata Paul Tipsuan, a child's rights to freedom of speech and expression should not stop at school gates. He added that school administrators and teachers will be encouraged to create spaces for students to express their opinions. On the other hand, PM Chanocha has in no uncertain terms refused to step down, saying, though the people have the freedom to protest based on the constitution, authorities need to control the illegal protests. The government has also ordered internet companies to block Telegram, the encrypted messaging app that protesters have been using to organise protests. Chapter 3. What now for the Thai monarchy? So, it's pretty difficult to say what the future of Thailand's monarchy will look like. But it wouldn't be the first time it has undergone a major change. In 1932, it ceased being an absolute monarchy, meaning one that controlled everything from state policy to choosing government officials. It's since transitioned to operating as a constitutional monarchy, one that draws comparisons to today's version of the British monarchy. In this version, rulers essentially have the right to encourage, the right to be consulted, and the right to warn. The relationship between kings and governments are continuously evolving, existing somewhere between formal courtesies and cultural obligations. Monarchies gain or retain influence partially based on past legacies and people's collective memories. Thailand is now examining the monarchy's role in a modern society. Are their kings important and powerful because historically, everybody agreed that they are? Or only because some people say so, and their positions of power are aligned with or depend on the fate of the monarchy as well? King Vajiralongkorn is in a tough spot and will face mounting pressures as the protests are drawn out. Already, he has tried to portray himself as close to the people. Whatever happens, Thailand's people clearly want him to act like a king and not someone who has simply inherited the crown with an obsession with pet dogs. <laughs>